that video? Did y'all like that? Yes, it's good. I, I'll tell you, this week I was on the phone with uh, someone that's actually on my top five card, and uh, it was funny what they said to me, because when I invited them to church and I asked if they had come to church with me, uh, they said, man, if I show up to church, the ceiling's going to fall in. How many of you have ever invited somebody to church and that's what they said? Come on. You should, you should comment back and go, no, I walk in there every week. You're going to be okay. You understand? <laughs> So really, I, because of the personality I have, I said, dude, I think you're okay. Now, if your wife comes with you, then we may have to call a contractor. But if y'all didn't think that was funny, maybe my sister-in-law. You have a sister-in-law like that. Okay, y'all are just not in it today. This is good. All right, well, I'll tell you what. It's the power of the person we invite. Next week, we're probably going to see a lot of, of things. This service right here. It's probably going to be pretty packed next week. If, if you're like, well, I don't really want to participate in the packed service, we have some other service times and options available to you. You can transition over to a Saturday at 4 o'clock or a Saturday at 6 o'clock. But Easter is always full, right? And it's full of people like that on the video. They may be lost. They're, they're there. And I want to tell you, for this church, we're a non-judgmental church. We're not going to judge you for what you've done, where you've been. We're just going to try to introduce you to a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. We're going to try to get you to allow him to come into your life and become your Lord. Amen? So if you're looking for some family members and different people like that to, to be introduced to a Savior who will become their Lord, then bring them here next week. Bring them here next week. If you have, have been with us and you hadn't filled this little card out, while I'm teaching today, why don't you fill this card out? Because it's, it's very important. We'll have a moment at the very end. We'll come and throw these back up at the altar uh, because souls being saved is the mission of Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. Not found lost. Amen. We have a harvest field in front of us and we would love for you to participate in that because we are praying revival over our city. That's what we're doing and we're going to see it in Jesus name. Three of you are okay and you're clapping a little bit, which is cool. Jesus changed the world with 12. We can flip a city with three. Matthew chapter 21. Y'all go ahead and turn there. It's very ironic today that Kenzie started the service out, our worship director, with the song Hosanna. And then I didn't know what Leona was going to be talking about in the offering. And she always brings some good knowledge to the offering talk. And, and I didn't know she was going to mention that. And God laid it upon my heart this week. This specific text wasn't in my original sermon that I'd put together. And I put it in there because of some verbiage stuff that's there. And today, we call today in Christian world and church world, Palm Sunday. And if you're a guest with us and you don't know what Palm Sunday is, it's okay. Nobody that does is better than you. It's cool. What it means is Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. It was prophesied about him. And when he did, people began to lay their clothes down on the ground and wave palm branches and, and begin to say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's why we call it Palm Sunday. Sunday. It was a week before Christ 
was crucified, or it was the week that Christ was crucified. So let's go to Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to pull a couple of key points out of this text, and then we're just going to kind of go through some things today. Is that cool? Are you ready? Ah, come on, church. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Matthew 21. I'm going to read verses 2 and 3, and then 8 through 10. Jesus instructed his disciples, and he said this, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord. Say that with me. Say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. It's very interesting. We're in a final installment of a four-week series that we've been doing called uh, Liar, Lunatic, or Lord, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Well, today I want to tell you that he is Lord. That's who he is. He is Lord. So they're going to immediately give him up and send him to me. Here we go. Verse 8. And a very great multitude... This is now Jesus is on the donkey. He is coming into Jerusalem. They spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, that is just representing the kingship. They were honoring. That's, that's what they would have done for a king when the king came into the city. Well, now they're doing this for Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is not just a king. He is the king of kings. Okay? So let's continue in the story. Verse 9, And the multitudes who went before and those who followed, they began to cry out, saying, Hosanna. That word Hosanna means adoration, praise, joy. They began to praise God, lift up just this adoration toward Jesus as he was riding in, in the final descent, to come and give his life up for me and you. Wow. And they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of, what? The Lord. Hosanna in the highest, verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. So his disciples and these people that knew Jesus and followed Jesus and they knew about Jesus, they came and they did this, but the whole city was moved. Let me tell you something. When we really begin to bring Jesus into the mix of everything that we do, let me tell you what will happen. The whole city will begin to be moved. And they're going to ask a question. It really ties in to our series that we're doing. And they ask this question, who is this? Who is this? I'll tell you who this is. You want to know who it is? Jesus is Lord. That's who it is. He's more than the Messiah. He is the Messiah, but he's more than the Messiah, more than a Savior. He is Lord. Lord. And someday you and I will know that truth. Someday we're going to know that truth. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Y'all remember this text, this scripture in the book of Philippians? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, right? And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Who is he? Lord. Jesus is Lord. You'll find that text in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. If I continued with some scripture today, because hopefully that's what we came to church for, I would go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Let's look and see what that says. That if you confess with your mouth the what? The Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you may be saved. No, 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 you will be saved. I love what verse 13 says in Romans 10. It says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those who call upon what? The name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. Isn't this an amazing moment that we can say Jesus is Lord? And you can't even really say that out of your mouth unless you know what lordship is. Do you know what lordship is? Is he Lord over your life? There's a good question for you to ask yourself while you're sitting here for the next 15 minutes or so. Is Jesus Lord? Well, what is lordship? Lordship is someone with authority or control or power over another. Now, we live in a society today that we don't want anybody like that in our life. 
Our culture causes us to push back on any type of authority. We want to rebel against authority. But if Jesus is the Lord of your life, he is your master. He is your ruler, right? When Jesus is Lord, we acknowledge his ownership and give up our personal rights. It's no longer about me. It's no longer about what I want to do. Now I've got to begin to serve Jesus and who he is and what he wants to do in my life. Am I making any type of sense today? See, yielding to that lordship of Jesus involves total and unreserved obedience. Look at your neighbor right now and say obedience. If Jesus is Lord in your life, he owns you. What does that mean, Pastor Jamie? He calls the shots. You don't call the shots. He calls the shots. I was, I was trying to make a decision this past week, and, and in my flesh, I don't want to make the decision that I know I should have made. And this wasn't a spiritual decision, but because I have caused and made Jesus the Lord of my life, who did I go to for counsel? I went to the Lord. Amen? And I begin to ask God. And the Bible says that the peace of God rules and reigns in our life. That word rule means umpire. So he either says safe or out. So when I go to Jesus because Jesus is my Lord, I begin to ask him what's going on in my life, and he directs my life. And if he says yes, when I feel no, I go with yes. Are we on the same page today? See, he calls the shots. Here's the problem, and I just touched on it, but we live in a culture that cancels everything. They call it cancel culture. If they don't like what you do or if they don't like all of this type of stuff, here's what they'll do. They'll write you off. See, it's dismissing something or something uh, or something or someone and begins to reject that individual or that, that idea that's out on the table. We're just going to reject that. We're going to cancel that out because that's not good. And the scary thing about that is I believe a lot of people are canceling the Bible in their life. They're canceling the Word of God because it's not lining up with your mission and your will and your way. I'm about to tip a pulpit over. I'm preaching so good. Come on. I'm going to make a statement, and I want you to write it down if you've got a pen. Many are seeking a Savior. But few are desiring a Lord. Many are seeking a Savior, but few are desiring to have a Lord in their life. And there's a difference between Jesus being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord. Are y'all with me today? Romans chapter 1, verse 1, I love it because Paul is writing a letter, and when he's writing this letter to uh, the people in, 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 in Romans, you know, the Roman people, uh, he's writing this letter, and he says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul, a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. A bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, you're probably sitting there going, well, what, what does that mean? Here's what he did. He acknowledged the lordship of Jesus in his life before he ever started writing the letter. And the cool thing is this. He said, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, comma, called to be an apostle. If we don't watch it, we'll put our calling in front of our servanthood and lordship that Jesus should have in our life. But what he was acknowledging is the lordship of Jesus. If you don't know this, the, the word bondservant in the Greek is the Greek word doulos, which literally means slave. Slave. Now, that, that's a word that, that has a negative uh, a reaction in a lot of us, including me. I just, I can't understand that stuff. But listen in this context. It literally means slave. And the job of a slave is to do whatever the master says to do. So what he was saying, he's saying, hey, I, my name is Paul. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. I'm a bond servant to Jesus Christ. He's my master. Here's the problem. If we don't watch it, we'll have too many masters. Jesus is not willing to be one among many masters in your life. That's why he has given us free will. And that's why a lot of people, they want to serve Jesus as Savior, but they don't want to serve Jesus as Lord. Jesus made a statement in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It won't come up on the screen. It's just coming to me, so just kind of write this down. But he said this. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Could you imagine being in the crowd that day? 
When Jesus is looking out and he's saying, hey, let me call some of you guys out just real quick. Why, hey, hey, you, yeah, you guys right over here. I want you to pull in just for a minute. This is Jesus talking. And he's like, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Because those are heavy words. That's master, ruler. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? Woo-wee. Come on, girl. It's good stuff, ain't it? In other words, you say that he's your Lord, but you're not even doing what he's saying. To make Jesus Lord means to repent of self-centeredness. To repent of self-centeredness. How many of you have ever been centered on yourself? Come on, I got my hands in the air right now. Uh, Jill said, I just felt it in the spirit. Jill said, raise both, son. Some of us, we can get so self-centered, we can get so focused on self that we miss the things that God wants to do in our life. Repentance is about turning around. If you go, what's that word mean, repentance? What is that? To repent literally means to turn around, to go in an opposite direction. Are y'all with me? Intentions doesn't determine destination. Direction does that. I told you this last week, so this is for some of you guys that wasn't here last week. See, a lot of people, when they make Jesus Savior, they intend on changing their life. Intentions doesn't determine destination. Your direction does. So what you have to be doing is you have to be lined up with Christ and pointed into the direction that Christ wants you to go in. And when you do, you'll get to the destination. If you only have intentions, it's almost like you saying, I'm going to hit 65 South to go to Memphis. You're moving, you're going somewhere, but it's not where you're supposed to be going. It's not where you've intended to go. You're going to end up in Mobile, Alabama is where you're going to end up, in the great state, Road Tide, hallelujah, in Jesus' name. But here's what you have to understand. That's just intentions. Are you lined up and pointed in the right direction? See, Jesus as Savior, and I want you to understand, I'm not knocking Jesus being our Savior. We need the Savior of the world. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They're going to be saved. So Jesus is our Savior, but that is the beginning spot. He wants to become your Lord. The mission of our church is we exist to see every lost person saved, saved person freed, freed person restored, and restored person fulfilled. There's a process. You you can't get freed and restored and fulfilled if Jesus is not the Lord of your life. You're going to stay in salvation. It's an insurance policy to get into the heaven uh, on on the hair of your chinny-chin-chin in Jesus' name. But Jesus as Savior, listen, emphasizes sins forgiven. Praise God. Awesome. Jesus as Lord puts the emphasis on a directional shift in your life, which includes sins forgiven. It's just an additional two. Here's what that means. I'm no longer the king of my domain. Jesus is. You're no longer the king of your little castle. Jesus is. See, and when you start comparing Jesus as Savior versus Jesus as Lord, one demands nothing of us, the other demands our everything. One demands nothing of us. Uh, uh, No man is saved by works. Jesus is Savior. You don't have to do anything for Jesus to become your Savior. But you're going to have to change for Jesus to be your Lord. Ah, hallelujah. Let me say it like this. Uh, uh, Jesus as Savior impacts me. Jesus is Lord impacts me and everybody around me. Which one do you want to do? You just want to impact yourself? Or do you want to impact yourself and everybody around you? I don't know about you, but I don't want to just do this for me so that I can get to heaven and I can feel good and my family's safe and I'm okay. They can live like heathens over there. They want to. No, no, no. If Jesus is Lord over your life, those people start looking at you going, I want to be like that. What's going on? There's, there's some change that's happening in Tommy's life. I, I, I wonder what Tommy's got going on. Let me tell you what Tommy had going on. Tommy moved from Jesus being Savior of his life to Lord of his life, and now the directional uh, shift has happened. And He's pointed in the right direction with Jesus. 
Come on. When, when we begin to do this, when we begin to do this, it, it literally changes the way. Jesus is Lord. It changes the way that we read the scriptures, the gospels. It changes the way that we understand what the, what the preacher's preaching and the C group is teaching. It changes the way that we live out the gospels. Why? Because now Jesus is Lord. And now my relationship is not limited to a Sunday morning. Ooh. Yeah. Because see, some of you, you, you say it during the week, I just can't wait to get back to church. I just can't wait to get back to church. Honey, you can have church on a Monday night. You can have a church going to Nashville on your way to work on a Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. You, you can be in the presence of a living God. I'm telling you, you don't have to wait for a weekend experience or a midweek program or, or even some of your religious duties that you do. You don't have to wait. Jesus is Lord. So here's the question that we should be asking ourselves. What happens when we make Jesus the Lord of our life? As I'm talking about that, I want you to get this out and I want you to put this in your hand. If you've already filled one out, praise God. If you've got more names on it, get ready to put them down, okay? I want you to get it out and I want you to hold it in your hand. What happens when we make Jesus the Lord of our life? Y'all go ahead and come on out, whoever's coming to play on the piano. What happens? Let me tell you what happens. There's a story in Acts chapter 16 that is very, very interesting. I'm going to paraphrase up to the point that we're going to read, which is verse 30 and 31. But don't pull it up on the screen just yet. So Paul and Silas is going through the city. And they have this lady that's following them. And she's saying good things. But she's saying it in the wrong spirit. So Paul rebukes the lady, cast out the demon. I mean, this lady's saying, hey, follow these guys. They're coming in the name of the Lord. I'm talking about, she's, she's speaking some churchy terminology, very churchy. But Paul and Silas rebuked that. The spirit comes out of her. This lady made profit for the leaders in the city. The leaders in the city got upset and put Paul and Silas in prison. So now we're getting close to where we're going to pick up. Paul and Silas is in prison. And we can learn from Paul and Silas because the Bible says at the midnight hour, my question to you is, if Jesus is Lord in your life, what do you do in the midnight hour? Midnight hour in the Bible representing the deepest, darkest time of that day. Just probably the pit. Here you got a guy that's chained to a wall, probably there beside her he is. He's there by a soldier, and, and, and they're literally in chains. And the Bible says that Paul and Silas begin to sing praises and hymns unto the Lord. Paul looked at Silas and said, Silas, you thinking what I'm thinking? He said, man, I got a song in my heart. And he started singing Amazing Grace. That's not really what happened, just so you know. Tell me, he was like, that's when that was written? That's, I was wondering when that was written. Paul begins to sing and Silas begins to sing and something begins to happen. The atmosphere shifts. Why? Because they know Jesus is Lord. See, if you know Jesus is Savior only, in the deepest, darkest moments, you'll continue to get further away from God instead of allowing those moments to draw you even closer to God. And they begin to sing praises, and they begin to do all of that. And the Bible says a great earthquake, earthquake came, and the, the walls of the prison were shaken. The doors began to open, and the chains were loosed from the people. Listen, not just Paul and Silas, but everybody in the prison. Isn't it amazing when you begin to make Jesus Lord of your life, you start unlocking other people's lives? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that crazy? This is what happens when we make Jesus the Lord. But now here's what I wanted to get to, because that jailer, the Bible says in the moment when he seen that everybody was free and the chains had loosed, he went to take his own life. He went to take his own life. And Paul's over there going, hey, 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 no, 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 no. Somebody light the torch. Hallelujah. Don't kill yourself. And as soon as he gets his attention, we come to verse 30. And this is the jailer talking to Paul and Silas. And he says, and he brought them out. He brought Paul and Silas out. And he said, sirs, what, might I, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, sometimes we stop right there. But I want to go a little further. You and your household. 
You? Yeah, some of you are getting it. It's, it's going to pick up in a minute. Nope, it died. Okay, let's keep going. You and your household. See, some people look at stuff like this, and, and some of you are like, Tammy, go ahead and fill it out. Here he goes again. I can't wait till next week. We won't have to look at these cards anymore. Bless God. Hallelujah. Some people look at cards like this and go, man, why do you do that? Every year, why do you do that? Because Jesus not only wants you saved, but he wants your whole household saved. I've got people of my household, not my direct household. Some of you are thinking, Jill done backslid. Hallelujah. Not people in my direct household, but I've got people under the, the, the household of, of my family tree that I'm writing down on here. And to be honest, they don't even live in this state. But you know what I've done? I've got a little, little bit of pull with those people. And so I, if I have to buy everybody's lunch to get them here on Easter Sunday because they're lost and they need Jesus, I'm going to buy everybody's lunch. I don't care what it's going to cost. I, I won't eat for three weeks out if I, if I have to pay a couple hundred bucks at old Charlie's to get all my family here. I'll do whatever I have to do. Push, pull, or drag. Make them compel. The Bible says compel people to come into his presence. Push, pull, or drag is what that word compel means. To make, push, pull, or drag. I'll do whatever I have to do. So some people look at me and they make fun of me and go, I can't believe you stand up there and you do that. Well, I don't know if those five people are important to you, but my five people are important to me. And what is cool about this scripture, and this is where I want to end, you and your household, the Greek word for household is oikos. Listen, this is where it gets good. Oikos, broken down in definition, is your direct family, your family, listen, and your descendants. So when you begin to give your life to Jesus and he becomes the Lord of your life, think about it. 200 years from now, if this world still exists, somebody will say, I've researched our family tree, and I finally figured out why there's a generation of preachers in our family. Do you know up until the early 2000s, our family was a family-ran farm, and it farmed for about 250 years? But there was a boy, which is my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather by the name of Jamie. And Jamie left the farm and started preaching. And when he did that, Everybody in our family, it began to shift because he would witness to us and he would show us the ways to the Lord and he would begin to quote scripture and he was never judgmental, but it changed our family. And now I'm a seventh generational preacher from my great, 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 great grandfather, Jamie. Come on, you need to put your name into my spot because you can do the same thing for your family. And then this is what I like about Oikos also. Sphere of influence. So it's everybody within your sphere of influence, all the way down to your descendants. Come on, they sang it earlier. May his favor be upon you. See, I was fixing to sing it, but I'm going to tell you, y'all waiting for me to sing it. To a thousand generations and your children, listen, and their children, and their children, and their children. Come on, church. Isn't it amazing? Stand to your feet real quick. I want to do something special today, and I know we're going a little bit over. We had some special time today, an extra five or seven, ten minutes, something like that, with child dedications, and that's good. We're not on a time schedule. Some of you's like, you may not be, <laughs> but I need to go eat me some Mexican. Let's just hold up just for a minute because I'm going to ask you, the prayer team is coming up. I'm going to ask you, if you haven't filled out one of these cards to fill this out, I'm praying over these names, praying over these names. We're believing next weekend that they're coming, okay? But above that, if you're in this room today, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you say, Pastor Jamie, I get, I get it. It was a little bit clearer to me today about Jesus as Lord versus Jesus as Savior, but I'll tell you where I'm at. Jesus is not even my Savior. I need Jesus right now. You know who you are. You need God. You need God to move. And look, 
In order for those around you to change, you got to change. Because you're, you're the only Bible some people are reading. And I'll be honest, I've been there before. Sometimes I didn't want people reading my Bible. I know I was going to church, but I wasn't living the life like I should live. Maybe that's you. I don't know. And you need to repent. You need to get rid of some things and come back to Christ. If that's you today, nobody's looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just raise up your hand real quick. Yes. Thank you. Right back there. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on. Raise your hand up if you need to get some things right with Jesus today. Yes. Thank you right there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. I see your hand. I got you. I got you. I got you. Anybody else? Yes. Right over here. I see you. I see you up here. God is moving in this church. I'm telling you. People are coming to the knowledge of Christ. Look, I want to introduce to you a Savior who wants to become your Lord. Right now, if you just raise your hand, maybe you're online and you say, hey, Pastor, that's me, that's me, that's me. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus. Come on, church, say it like you mean it. Let's just all support it. Say, Jesus, I've messed up. I've put things in front of you. But as of today, I repent. All of the things I've done, everything I should have done, I lay it at your feet. I want a brand new start. Today is the day of my salvation. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving my soul and use me from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap. Come on, church. So here's what I want you to do. Right now, wherever you're at, right now, step out of your seat if you've ever filled out one of these and put it on the altar. Or if you're bringing it today and putting it on the altar, I want you to step out of your seat. Get up here. Just come gather around the altar today. A little bit different than what we usually do. It's okay. We have a moment, people. Next week, we have a moment, an opportunity, and your friends and your family, your loved ones are going to get saved in Jesus' name. We're believing that. Come on. If you've ever filled out one of these cards, step out of your seat. And what I'm praying is those of you, and I'm not saying, hey, those of you that's not stepping out or whatever, but if you haven't filled out one of these cards, I want you to really start believing that God can save your family. It's one of the visions of this church. That people that attend this church don't just attend this church, but their family comes to the knowledge of Christ because of the relationship that they have with Jesus. Here's what I want to do. Those of you that are standing around the front, I want to thank you. I want to commend you for writing names down. Here in a moment, we're going to pray over these names. Not every one of them, but God knows every name that has been written down with ink on these papers. God knows. And today, we just want to lift these names up. We want to have a special prayer time uh, around this because we really feel like people are going to come to the knowledge of Jesus that are on these cards next week. I want to say, Calvin's not in this room, but I want to say there's 15, 1600 names before today that was on pieces of paper. Listen, revival, that's what we're praying for. Revival, a move of Jesus. Bow your heads with us. Come on, everybody in the whole room, come on. Let's lift up these names to Jesus. You know your names right now. Go ahead and begin to lift up those names to Jesus. Father, you see every person that has been written down. You see, God, the opportunity that we have. And I pray boldness over this congregation. God, like that man in the video, would they just invite me? I need you to be open to invite me. There's a statistic that says 82% of people say that they would come to church if they were only invited. So, Father, I pray today, Jesus, that you will begin to put in our spirit what we need, God, the words. Some of us were just nervous, and it's just so nerve-wracking to witness to others and, and to be that witness and be that man or woman of God that we need to be. We want to be that way. But, it, but it's just tough because our nerves get the best of us and, and we don't have that boldness that we need. I pray that boldness over them. So, Father, today we declare that the names on these cards, Jesus, would feel something this week. They'll get that personal invite. They'll show up. If they don't show up at this church, God, but they show up at another church, at least they're in your presence. God, we just ask you to draw all men unto you. Your word says when we lift you up, that's what's happening. So, Father, we lift you up today. We know, God, 
that you're going to do great things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give God a big shout today. Those of you that are up here, uh, you can stay up if you want. You can go back to your seat. But if you're in this room, would you stay with us a couple more minutes? We just want to worship. We want to get our minds right because next week's a big week for our church. Next week's a big week for you. Y'all worship with us just for a couple more minutes. Give the Lord a big old hand clap today. Come on, church. He's so good. Here's what I want to tell you. Next week uh, is going to be a big week for us. We've talked about it all day today. We always spend extra time in our services the week prior to Easter, just letting you know. When you leave today, we've bundled a group of invite cards in groups of five. Go figure. Top five. Five invite cards. Don't, don't be a bad steward this week and take these and put them on your dashboard or take these and throw them in your console or throw them in the trash, you know, once you get home. This right here could change the direction of your family. It's that important. It's that important. So for me and Jill, we just want to invite you guys to just come hand in hand with us. Would you? to reach this community. This is one of the ways that we're gonna do it. We're not doing it, guys, for big numbers. That's not why we do what we do. We do it because we know that there's people in this community that need Jesus. Go out there. Be the hands and feet of Jesus today. Don't leave this room. Don't leave this building without some of these. We got greeters out in the lobby. It's gonna be passing these out on your way out. Grab them. If you want 20, 30, 40, you get them. Whatever you want. Let's partner together to do that. It's going to be great. Again, if you're saying, man, I, I don't know if me and my family want to be part of a jam-packed service. Look, this, this is one of those services that if you don't mind to transition over to a 4 p.m. or a 6 p.m. service next week, or actually this week, six days from now on a Saturday, the experience is going to be exactly the same. 
It's going to be the same services. We have five services available, again, Saturday, 4 and 6, and then Sunday, 8.30, 10.15, 11.55. God bless you. I can't wait to testify what God's going to do next week. Love you guys. We'll see you on Easter.